Welcome everyone, welcome, welcome to the final day of the 7 Days for 7 Ways to Gamify series. This is to celebrate Vibrant Music Teaching's first birthday. Vibrant Music Teaching is one today. I started that site to help teachers put games in their lesson in a way that was effective, fun, and really focused on what students needed to learn. I started that exactly one year ago today, and it has been a awesome ride so far. I have so enjoyed it, and I hope that all of you have too, who've been along with me for the ride. Today, I'm going to be giving away the final bonus prize. Alan here is at the ready. It's Alan, my coconut, in case you haven't met him. So Alan is filled with the comments from yesterday's broadcast, and he's going to be deciding who gets the odd cracker-shaped orange prize just here. And then after that, I will draw the winner of the one-year VMT membership from all of the entries over the past six days. If there's any of them that you missed, I have set up a replay page for you. So you can get to that if you go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash bday. So that is vibrantmusicteaching.com slash bday. And all six days so far, and soon to be seven, including today, all of those workshops are there. And we've covered a huge breadth of topics, all to do with gamifying your lessons, adding games in, in a way that's effective for you in various different contexts and covering various different concepts. So I hope you'll check those out. It's been a really fun six days, seven today, and I hope that all of you have enjoyed it as well. I'd love to know if any of you have made every single one live because I've varied the times uh, quite a bit to catch different people when they're not teaching and not sleeping. But has anyone made every single one? I'd love to hear from you if you did. Whether you've been watching them live or on the replay, though, I do hope you've enjoyed them. And I have had a blast myself. Today, we're going to be talking about planning effective gamification for your lessons. Big topic, but I'm going to be taking you through my process, three steps to planning lessons with games in a way that is not overwhelming and actually works. At least I hope it will work for you. It certainly works for me. I do, you can't enter today's drawing by commenting today because obviously I needed to organize those comments in advance, but I still have a question of the day for you because I would love to know uh, how you get on with lesson planning so far. Do you make them? No shame if not. I know a lot of teachers, piano teachers, don't make lesson plans and that's totally fine. I hope to convert you a little bit that it can be really beneficial and not overwhelming and not restrictive today. But let me know what your experience has been with lesson planning so far, whether it's about games or just lesson planning in general. I'd love to see that in the comments. Hello to Beth. Uh, I think Beth is live. Amy is definitely live. Caroline, Dawn, Rachel, Claire, Cindy, everyone else who's watching, please do say hi in the comments. It would be great to hear from you and hear how you're getting on today. It's a wonderful, beautiful, sunny Tuesday in September here in Dublin. So, um, beautifully bright and I went for a lovely walk this morning myself. Today, as I say, we're going to be talking about planning lessons. And one tool that will make your lessons super easy to plan is Vibrant Music Teaching Membership. So if you're not already a member, I'd like to encourage you to give it a go, to jump on over to vibrantmusicteaching.com and see if it might be right for you. You can go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash membership or click on the membership tab when you're on the main page of the website. And that will show you everything you need to know about it. I give you full walkthrough videos, information about it, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you want to figure out whether it's a good fit for you. I will be honest about if or if not uh, it will be a good fit for you, depending on your circumstances. So you can hit the chat bubble when you're on the site to find out more from me, and I'll get back to all of your questions as soon as I possibly can. On to today's training, though. We need to talk about step one. And step one is the lesson format in our formula for lesson planning today for including games in your lessons in a way that is effective and fun and really gets to the heart of what you want to teach because that's what I'm all about. I'm not about games for the sake of games or brain breaks or as rewards at ends of lessons. That's fine 
it's still better than no games at all. But I'd like to take it a step further. I think games can do some of your heavy lifting for you. And that's the process I want to take you through today. Um, Rachel just said, I caught at least a little bit of each of them live. Okay, so I managed to get your time zone the whole way through there, Rachel. Um, Mountain Daylight Time. Awesome. Some of them were quite early. Like, this is quite early there, right? It's great that you were able to join me uh, live. Carolyn just shared her experience Lesson plan, she said, I don't make formal lesson plans, but I do think about what I need to do with certain students. And for young students, I do create a plan in my head and prepare any needed materials. That's great. Thanks for sharing, Carolyn. So I'm going to take you through my planning process. And for me, at the moment, it starts with the lesson format. My lesson formats are vague enough to be repeatable each and every week. Okay? So they are the same format pretty much every week, or I'll have two alternate formats. And I'm going to show you what one looks like in just a second here. This means that I save stress and thinking time. I mean, even if you're not stressed out about something, if it's whirring away in the back of your head, that is wasting your brain energy. <laughs> Very technical, sciencey term. Um, so that you're not actually focused on the task at hand. And you want to be focused in on exactly what you're doing now, not all the other stuff that's in the back of your mind, because there's already enough stuff in there. I know there is. So what order you're going to do things in in a lesson shouldn't be one of those things. Planning out the lesson format will save you all of this thinking time when you go to plan the actual lesson content each week. It's predictable. Now, you can stray out from it, but it being predictable every week in terms of the format you're going to do the lesson in is actually beneficial for your students for the most part. Yes, predictable can be boring, but only after a certain point. Up to that point, especially with kids, it's beneficial. It's good for them that you do things in the same format every time, the same order, because it helps them stay on top of where they are in the lesson. And actually for a child, that's pretty hard to do. You know, if you've ever had kids ask you, when is the lesson over? It's not just because they're bored or they're trying to be rude. It's certainly not that they're trying to be rude. Kids are never really doing that maliciously. The reason they're asking that is because half an hour or 45 minutes is just a completely different concept to them. They do not see the world the same way you do, um, and they do not perceive time the same way you do. So having a predictable lesson format can help them follow where they are Stop them from asking that question because it might get on your nerves and just help them feel grounded in the lesson. Amanda just shared her experience with lesson plans. Just want to check that there. She said, yes, I make lesson plans. I feel I like to feel organized and also like to see the progress they are making week to week and term to term. Good point. It helps me make uh, me plan long term goals. Also, I think my head would become a mess. <laughs> If I didn't plan specifically for each student, I totally get where you're coming from there, Amanda. So when I'm making these lesson formats, they are predictable, but they're not restrictive. I'm not stuck in them. If I decide in the moment that actually I would like to do singing before we do rhythm, that's fine. But having that predictable pattern saves you thinking time. And most of the time you can fit into that and it will help you to be more creative thinking within those segments and get the most out of your lesson time. That's what this is really all about. Um, now, I have a sample to show you here. And actually, I have a sample. And then I have a sample later in the video to show you of the other part of this process. Both from the same lesson. This is a partner lesson with two of my students. Um, and they do a sort of partner with slight rotation in the middle. I have so many different ways that I do lessons, so I don't want you to take this format and go, okay, that's my format, because it's different even for each one of my students. So it doesn't have to be the same for all your students. It can be similar, but I suggest that you make one when you're planning each student or each pair of students or each group's lessons, make a format that's going to fit in the things that you need to cover each week with that student or set of students. So this is my format for partner lessons. And as you'll see, in this case, I have two that I alternate. So I have um, it, I have an hour with them. 
So five minute rhythm warm up, five minute oral, then 20 minutes solo slash iPad plus theory. That means that one is at the piano with me, um, working one on one, and the other is doing their theory workbook for they normally have to complete a certain number of pages and then iPad work after that um, when they're finished. Then we have a game during the crossover and then the other one is at the piano and the other one is at theory. Lesson format two there, we've got rhythm and oral still starting with the same two things and a lot of my students will be starting with those two. Then we've got um, a different format because in that case I'm working on duets with them so they do play some duets and they're not doing those every week so sometimes I want to do one sometimes I want to do other that's how I have it split up for them for a lot of students it will be the same every week but it completely depends on the circumstance so I don't want you to look at that I mean you're welcome to look at that and take it and run with it for all your students but that's not really what I'm suggesting what I'm suggesting is that you come up with a format that covers the things you want to cover in broad categories and you can stick to almost every week because planning within that format and um, especially when you're planning like we're going to or I do across weeks and weeks and weeks of lessons it helps if you have that predictable structure because then you have these um, themes or these headings to fit stuff under so that's one of my partner lessons and this is actually what I display during the lesson to show them and keep them on track with where we are. These are the new um, visual lesson plan cards and these are the full set is inside VMT and the smaller set is free on the blog. So whether you're a VMT member or not you can at least get a few of them. VMT members will get the full set inside the library and it's towards the top guys if you remember hop into the library it's up near the top because it's a fairly new resource I have magnets on the back of these because I have a magnetic whiteboard ie a big sheet of metal <laughs> in my studio as my notice board so I stick these up there and that way the students know what my plan is roughly they don't know what each activity is but they can follow where we are and it's been really helpful. As I mentioned in the blog post where I talked about those lesson magnets, this actually came out of the idea of um, having a visual lesson plan. really comes from working with special needs students and um, students with special needs needing to know exactly where we were. And then I thought, hey, this is useful for just humans. Why am I reserving this for students who have special needs? So I decided to try it out with all my students, created this set, and shared them with VMT members. So that's how I set up the lesson format. And from there, once I have the lesson format, and by the way, I'm doing this in a big Google Sheet, so that is over the right-hand side. And once I have that lesson format, that's when I'm going to look at week-to-week -week trajectory. So step two is my trajectory. And what I mean by trajectory is basically curriculum but in a looser, I don't want to say looser sense, but a more succinct sense, right? It's not wordy, it's just week to week, a, a word or two, so that I know where we're headed. And this is influenced by a ton of stuff. As I said, each sheet is for individual students or groups of students, so it's not something I do for my whole studio in one go, that doesn't work, but I do do this for a semester at the time for all students. So I'm not doing this every single week and spending hours and hours lesson planning. I have this overall guide, this system that I'm sharing with you today, set up at the start of the semester and then it's actually running into the second semester at the moment and then as I get there I'll set up the next semester and it's really only a few hours for all of my students we're talking about 36 or 7 students okay so it's not a huge investment of my time but it means I can go in week to week see the sheet and see are we actually up to there first of all do I still agree with that I might want to change it but most of the time I, I was right quote unquote not that there is a right but are we actually up to there? Are we still aligned with where our goals want to go? Are we still heading towards the same place or has it changed? And what do I need to do um, this week to keep us on that path? And if during a week 
I'd have to change something in the middle of the lesson or during my planning before the lesson, then I'll write that in in the sheet so I adjust it as I go. So the thing that influences my trajectory then is um, could be guideposts such as, this is an easy one in a way, and why they're so tempting to a lot of teachers over here and in Australia is um, exams, right? So say I have a student who's heading towards grade two theory. Well, it's very easy to see when that exam is going to be, to know the things that they need to cover for that exam. I say easy. Obviously, you need to put some research into it, but it's set out for you, right? So if you know you're heading towards that and you need to cover that material that they haven't covered so far for that exam, that gives you a clear guidepost. It could also be that a student is doing an audition for something. It could be that you just want them to get to some point and you have it set in your mind. But it, guideposts are definite things that you can structure other things around. It could also be based on their method books. So this is one jumping off point. I don't like to encourage using method books as a curriculum because I think that's doing the same thing as when teachers fall into the trap of putting students on the exam express and just going with that. Same idea, not really the best idea, but starting from a method book, especially as a beginner teacher, can be very useful. So I would like to encourage you to start from there if you're feeling a bit lost. Take a look at your method book's table of contents and just go, okay, well, they normally get through this many songs each week. So that would take us up to here by then, here by then, and then you can build this out um, over the course of a semester based on where they might be likely to get up to. But once you have that trajectory based on the method book, I'd like to encourage you to go that little bit further and go, actually, is there any of these concepts that I would prefer to introduce earlier? And is there any that I know they'll need to review again, but the method book doesn't actually loop back around to them? So that can give you a great starting point. Otherwise, just general goals. These could be your goals for your student, especially at younger ages, or your students' goals. Do they want to learn how to play Claire de Lune by the end of this year? Or for Elise, God forbid, or, you know, Despacito. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be also that they have particular goals about the level or anything. Or it could be your goals. And it should probably be a mix of both in most cases. But giving yourself some kind of structure to build out this trajectory, fill in the things that you do know. I definitely want them to know about Quaver's eighth notes by Christmas. That's just a random example. But if that's true, then great, work back from that. Fill in whatever goals you have for your students and then you'll fit other things in around them. And you can loop around to different things and cover things in different ways. Let me know if this is all making sense, guys, as I work through here. Um, this is my thought process, obviously, so if some of it is unclear to you, I'd love to answer your questions and clarify it, because it, it does work extremely well for me as I fill these things out across the course of a semester. Um, so, step three then, the last step, is to fill in the blanks. Sounds simple, eh? Super simple lesson planning. Fill in the blanks. So you're going to want to prioritise based on these goals. Um, split them up as much as you can and break down the concepts so that you can see how they split up. So it's not just, I want them to know their note names. That's too vague. You have to be specific along the way so that each week you have a core thing that you want to focus in on, like an extra thing. Yes, you might also have pieces that are ongoing, method book pieces or other repertoire or whatever, that you do every week, and that's fine. But if you have key concepts that you want to hone in on each week, you can set up all your other activities around that, fill in your lesson format, and away you go. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. And then you're also going to want to plan for some rotation. So say you know you can't get to composing and improvising and arranging every week, but you want to cover all three. Well, you need to plan some kind of way to rotate these. I'm using monthly themes this year to make sure they're all covered. You might like to do it that week, that way. You might like to do it one, two, three, four, rotating around like that each week. So first week of the month is always composing week, for example. Whatever way works for you. You're also going to want to rotate or spiralize um, 
the theory concepts. Do not just cover note stems and then never come back to it again. That's the big mistake that I think a lot of us make as beginner teachers. If you come back to these things around and around and around, it's going to, well, it's going to be real teaching, right? It's going to actually solidify these concepts in your student's mind so that you're never going, but I taught you that. You didn't teach them that if you only did it once. So you need to come back to these things again and again and work on it that way and rotate in things as you go through. It may mean that you get less done over the course of a year, but you get it done better. And that's what I'm all about. And games play a huge role in how I teach all of these things. How they actually get embedded in my students' brains. So I'm going to show you a sample lesson um, plan, or rather semester plan, over the course of 20 weeks or so for this partner lesson. So I'll show you the format again. It doesn't all fit on the one, so let me just show you that. Uh, this one, right? So this is the same pair of piano partners. When I say partner, I mean that they, they take lessons for the entire lesson together. They have one hour together each week. If I talk about buddy lessons, that is different. That's when they have part, part of the lesson together, not all of it. So what I don't want you to do with this is to... Take it and um, go, okay, I'll, I'll follow that. Or try to note it all down. Or go, but she has these headings. No, the whole point is you take your format that makes sense for you. That could be similar to mine or completely different. And you fill in the blanks for you, for each student. So this looks different for each one of my students or student pairings. And it will for yours too. So I, I just want to emphasize that because I don't want people trying to asking me later for a copy of this because it's going to be useless. It is based on your student. So this is what this looks like, just to give you a sense of it, right? So I've got up until Christmas in this particular sheet and some of them I've planned all the way until the end of January. Then I have a theme, which are the studio-wide monthly themes. So those are in that column there. Uh, the grey is where we had a week off because I was away that Monday. So there's nothing there. The main focus there is what I want to focus on the most that week. Now, they sometimes match up to the monthly themes and sometimes they don't. So Practice Pro, you'll see three weeks of practice quality as my main focus there. Um, but the first week is Note Name inter Interval Review because that was the first week back. Then heading into the second month, October, we've got Accidentals, Accidentals, two weeks in a row on that one. And I'll loop back on that later in the year, so I'm not leaving it there. After that, we're doing Semitones, Tones, and Enharmonics. So actually, by the way, that's whole and half steps for those in the US. Actually, the reason I'm doing the two weeks of Accidentals is because I filled in the Semitones and Tones first. Because I wanted to get to that point with these this particular student pair at that stage and then I said okay but we have to be absolutely 100,000% sure of accidentals or this is not going to work so I went back and put those in two weeks before it. From there terms dynamics that's actually that would have been one of the last ones I filled in so the other ones went in first and then terms dynamics just a general review of those things um, will fit in where I have space for it. Then heading into the third month there, we've got writing scales, review of semitones, tones and harmonics. Make sure you don't forget them. So three weeks later, do those again just to make sure. And I'll do them again later in the year, of course. And then heading into chord month, we've got major and minor chords. Um, and then chord inversions going into accompanying. And actually in that case, I'm going to be doing Christmas lead sheets and accompanying each other while they play the melody um, because of where they're at. So from there I've got laid out the lesson format for each normal lesson. Rhythm, oral, gamer activity, backup game, that's just if I think one might run a bit short. And then the challenge if they're going to be working on one at that time. Those are based on challenges I do for my challenge board. 
Okay, so rhythm, I won't go through all of them, but ta ti ti swap is something you'll see in a video in VMT soon if you're a member. Rhythm vocab one you'll already be familiar with. So these are just notes that literally will make almost no sense to most of you most of the time. Obviously the game is a name of a game, but everything else should look a bit like gibberish. And that's what I want yours to look like. It should make sense to you. And from there, I go into that Google Sheet each week and I write out a post-it. Literally just a post-it. Plain old post-it. And I write down, okay, uh, in that order, in the order we're going to do them, rhythm is ta ti ti swap so I just write ta ti ti and then self a door. Like, it might look like nonsense, but that goes on the front of their folder, and then inside I have their actual assignment sheets, which have the details about their repertoire and stuff like that. But this is all the other stuff, right? So that goes on a post-it. I hope that makes sense to you, and that maybe it looks like a good system for you. If you want to see actually how I set up the Google Sheet, you can go to my YouTube channel to see that. Um... Should be one of the recent videos, but anyway, if you Google, or YouTube rather, YouTube search Colourful Keys Google Sheets, that'll that'll get you there. Um, and in that video, I it's a fairly blank sheet, but I'm just explaining how I actually set up the side in case people aren't so techy or aren't used to the Google suite. Um, on the side, how do you get all the dates in without much effort, like just clicking and dragging. If you're used to Excel, it all works the same way pretty much then the week numbers, and then how I decide what goes in the headings. But I'm not showing you that full filled in sheet because that's based on your student. Please let me know if this was useful, guys. Um, like I said, this is my thought process. Yours might be different, but I hope it'll give you a jumping off point to work on all this stuff because I get a lot of questions about how these things are planned out. And I think this is a useful process to go through, especially at the start of a new semester or term where you can do it in a big chunk a big day with lots of coffee at your side <laughs> so uh just checking in with the comments there amy said thank you thank you thank you and oh to convince parents of this concept that you don't need to teach it only once do you do your parents interfere with that i tell them to butt out amy <laughs> get out of my face no i wouldn't say that but you know that's your business if you need to teach it a bunch of times. And I've never had a parent question that, actually. But I've never had them question in that much detail about what I'm doing. More, the questions I would get in Ireland are, when is he going to do an exam? And I say, when I say so, go away. Get out of my face. No, I'm only joking. Never say that. But if I make it really clear that I have a plan, that I do do this type of planning, and this is another reason to do it, because if a parent comes to you pushing for whatever a festival, an exam, a particular piece, scales, doesn't matter. If you can say, no, I've planned it all out and this is the reason I've prioritised it this way and I've split up the concepts this way, often all they wanted was to be reassured that there is a plan in place. I actually had an um, email recently from one of my piano parents and his, um, so I teach his daughter and his son is taking guitar lessons in a different place. I don't teach guitar. Wasn't somewhere I know, don't know the teacher, nothing like that. So I have no idea about the situation. But he basically emailed me to say, I didn't realise that other music teachers didn't actually think about where the students are headed. And I'm wondering if you know a guitar teacher that's like you. And I'm like, well, no. <laughs> but that guitar teacher might have a plan. The point is to communicate it as clearly as possible. Amy chimed in again there. They think once and they think and they've learned it. The parents? Again, I'm, I'm baffled by these parents you have, Amy. I do tell them that there is always circling back reinforcement. Yeah, go back to what the goal is. Is the goal for them to, you know, be able to play these things successfully or be able to pass a test one time and never come back to it again? I think they'll agree with you once you frame it that way because uh, tests are not the point of stuff and learning stuff once really only sets you up for a quiz the next day. Um, 
Beth just came in with her answer there to the question of the day. Let me tell you what that is. This is not for a V of T entry, by the way, guys, because I've already printed out the comments are ready to go. So those are all from the first six days. But the question that I would love you to answer today is, do you make lesson plans for your lessons at the moment? And how are they working out for you? Beth just said... Uh, plan all my lessons, but I'm adaptable and change when the lesson needs to. I take off periods of time as sabbaticals and reevaluate all the records and see what needs updating. Great system, Beth. So I hope you have all found my system useful and that it's given you some insight, even if you want to do it completely differently might give you a new perspective just as an exercise. Um, and thank you all for the happy birthdays coming in. I am delighted to have you all join me for... BMT's actual birthday. Now, on to the important stuff, right? Are you ready? Alan's ready. Hey, Alan. Okay, Alan's coming. Alan is going to announce the winner for the final mini prize, as it were. Some of them are pretty big, though. Uh, the orange present right now to celebrate BMT's first birthday. And then we're going to do the drawing for the annual VMT membership as well after that. Let me see here. <gasps> Who's it going to be? Josie! She said, rarely need a better system, so this helps. This is on yesterday's broadcast. Fantastic! Josie, we're going to open the orange present for you. If you're live, let us know, Josie. If you're not, I'll get in touch with you later. Da, 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 da. This is what's inside the cracker. Christmas cracker. It needs some unwrapping. It's still pretty mysterious. Do you want to guess what this is? Just give you a quick look there. Opening it up here. Okay, so. This is probably my favourite. We've got these little erasers. These are smaller than a Wacker one, so they fit even nicer on the keys, and they're flat, so they stay put. They're great for working on scales. And I have cacti and llamas. So those are going out to you, Josie, once you let me know your address and all that stuff. As are all of these fantastic stickers. Paper Chase are my favorite stickers, so that's where these are from. We've got Day of the Week stickers. Perfect for practicing and stuff like that. We've got llamas to match your beautiful new erasers. You can't see these that well, but anyway. We've got fruit. Now, the idea behind the fruit was... I saw them and I thought, oh, amazing. Because you know how a lot of us teach rhythms using fruit? Like apple, 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 pear. That kind of stuff. If they keep forgetting a certain section, like if you have 16th notes or... Semi quavers, then it's watermelon, watermelon, that kind of stuff. Um, perfect for sticking above there. And then we've got all these hilarious faces, which are like unicorns and different things, but making different faces. So perfect for bringing out emotion in the pieces. So congratulations to Josie. Those will be going out to you. Now, Alan needs to add his loot into the box here. These are all the entries from the first five days and about to be six and we're going to draw the winner of one year's VMT membership. It gets you access to all of the games, all of the training, the courses, the uh, webinar recordings, the live uh, calls with me if you need to get input on something. What else do we have? Oh my gosh, everything. So this is the full set. This is too big for Alan. I'm afraid he's being, uh, sorry, he's about to roll off the table there. Alan is going to have to wait this one out because I needed a box to fit all of the entries in over this super fun week. So let's give it a good shake. Okay, are we ready? Let's see who it is. I'm going to do it without looking, just to be sure there's no bias here, okay? Maria Johnson is the winner of the one-year subscription to VNT. 
congratulations, Maria. Haven't seen you live, but if you're here, let us know. If not, I'll be in touch with you later. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to get you into the library or to renew your subscription if you're already a member. For those of you who um, are not members, what are you waiting for? If you've enjoyed this series, there is tons more training and games and awesomeness to be found inside Vibrant Music Teaching, and you can get access to it by going to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash membership and signing up. It's uh, $20 a month, which is less than one lesson for most people everywhere per month and you're getting everything people often ask me well how many games can i download at once you can download everything and run away and steal everything from me if you want to i'm going to trust that you're not going to do that because i don't want to penalize people who are honest by restricting anything so you can jump in you can find exactly what you need for your student to fill in your lesson plan like we were doing today or whatever other projects you have going on. You can make custom lists of the games to prepare for stuff like group workshops or, as I say, to review with a particular student. You can make a list called Susan and a list called Alan and use this as your lesson planning resource. And you can get access to some amazing courses such as the 40-week Tiny Finger Takeoff, which will take you through an entire first year of teaching with a young beginner student or really any beginner who needs to go at a slower pace. You can get uh, so many different things. The latest one, which is about to be released, is the 12-week Circle of Fists Odyssey. And that is going to take your students on an improvisation and chord-based and games-based journey all around the Circle of Fifths so they can get a thorough grounding and understand what scales are all about. So if you enjoyed the scales workshop earlier in the week, you're going to love that course. I'm super excited to release it. Worked really hard on that one. If you want to catch the repl replays, don't know what that word was going to be, replays of any of these workshops, including today's one, once I get it up, you can go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash bday to find them all in one place, because I know it's a bit awkward on Facebook to find the videos and all of that. So they're all on one page there. You can look through all of them. Watch them soon if you're not a VMT member because they might come down in just a few weeks. Uh, if you are a VMT member, of course, you will get lifetime access. That's always, always the case with any trainings I do and with pretty much every resource I create too. Thank you all so much for joining me. There's some lovely comments coming in. Um, Jennifer just said, my daughter is listening in the background and she just ran to the piano and started trying watermelon on the keyboard. I love that. That's fantastic, Jennifer. Maybe she can compose something for me based on it. Um, even if she just experiments, that still gives me a kick. That's so fun. Crystal said, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Nicola, and congrats on a successful first year. Yeah, it's been an absolute blast. And I actually want to take this opportunity. I have loads of thank yous coming in for me, but I want to thank all of you, all of the Vibrant Music Teaching members who are watching right now and who are watch watching later on the replay. Thank you all for being part of this community. I get messages every day that I literally can't believe how lovely people are. <laughs> All the best people are inside Vibrant Music Teaching. They are all so wonderful and lovely and charming. Um, and I literally get all these lovely emails and messages and Facebook comments every day. And it makes my work absolutely worth it. And I love putting together all this stuff for you guys. So thank you for joining me for this special series. I'm going to get back to my normal routine and get cracking on some new games for October. Because the first is rolling around fast. And I've got some great ideas based on member requests for next uh, month's games. Which is just a couple of weeks. And the Circle of Fifth Odyssey is releasing to you guys next week also. So that's going to be super fun. Thank you all so much again for joining me. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll chat to you soon. Bye for now, guys.